Right, okay, I think we're ready to go, guys. Um, uh, I'm so embarrassed. This is really very, very embarrassing and not the level of service that we would normally uh, want to deliver. Um, so uh, my sincere apologies. It's a good job we're not charging for any of these, otherwise you'd be getting a full refund. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to Emma Passand, who is uh, the menopause expert, and she's going to be talking to us about menopause in the workplace. So thank you very much, Emma. Okay. Okay, so I don't have control of my slides, do I? No, I don't. OK, so I think I'll just have to do Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. I've been sat here for 25 minutes as well, but I'm glad that you all um, have stuck it out. Um, I will. Oh, I will. Um, hold on one second. Apparently, I have control over my slides. No, I don't. I don't. Someone else's curse is on, on the screen. I will, um, I'll run, I, obviously I'm not going to rush through it, but I appreciate that everybody's been waiting. I won't introduce myself. My work will um, become apparent as I go through um, the talk and um, and what I do and what this is about. This I like this. This is my favourite talk. This is about menopause and it's about um, talking to clinicians. Um, and this pre-COVID, this was what I did. It was women's health at work. And as a clinician, um, and in occupational health especially, uh, these were this was the research that I used to base my work on. And it was it, you know, the first three ones were women needed to be empowered to get support for their health through greater recognition of conditions and ensuring parity alongside with other workplace health issues. Now, bear in mind this is pre-COVID. Um, so I'm going to be talking about reproductive health, I'm going to be talking about menstruation, um, endometriosis, but we're focusing on menopause today. The second one, gender inequality, both inside and outside of the workplace, can affect women's occupational safety and health with important links between wider discriminations issues and health. That is more apparent post-COVID, which I'll come to. The third one, there are substantial differences in the world, in, in the working lives and employment situation of women and men and therefore occupational safety and health. So we need to take into account gender issues in work related risks and their prevention. Now this prior to COVID-19, the GP consultation rate for women was 32% higher than it was for men. And in part, this was due to reproductive related issues um, and consultations, sorry. So with this in mind, I want you to um, think about your own practice, women that you may see in the workplace, women you may see for case management, uh, for health, health surveillance, health screening, you may well talk about re reproductive health, but health surveillance and case management and whether you have an inclusive approach and um, incorporate, incorporate reproductive health in your assessments. Next slide, please. Someone controlling the slides? It's supposed to be Danny, but um, uh, Danny, can you move on to the oh, we, Here we go. OK, what makes a woman? OK, so this is what we all do as clinicians. We do a biopsychosocial um, and cultural approach. So press again, please. Hello. OK, I'll just talk biological. So the biological um, aspect of being a woman, predominantly a working woman, is your reproductive health. There is endometriosis that can be a factor. There is PMDD, which is um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. There is polycystic ovary syndrome. There are infertility problems. There are childbirth dysfunctions after after giving birth and there's a pregnancy and menopause pregnancy and menopause are obviously not health conditions um, but we will be talking about them in this sphere of, of a health condition from now on 
So endometriosis, there was an all-party parliamentary group report that came out last year, and it was based on um, 10,000 women giving their experiences of what it was like to have endometriosis. Ten years ago, it was a similar report, and ten years ago, it found that it took eight years to get a diagnosis. And the report last year found it still took eight years to get a diagnosis. The NICE guidelines um, came out on endome endometriosis recommendations and care, um, and it was not adopted. The guidelines and the uh, quality standards have not been adopted in primary care. So as a result, it still takes eight years. Um, you're less likely to see an endometriosis specialist because you may have bowel issues and you will go down that route. So um, most women do not see an endometriosis, endometriosis specialist. There's 1.5 million in, um, in the country that suffer with endometriosis. That's 10% of the working population. And on average, it took a woman um, eight times to go to her GP. 58% attended A&E, and out of that, half of them attended more than three times before they got a diagnosis. 38% um, felt that their work had suffered and they, um, their well-being at work had suffered, and 35% of them had said they'd taken a lesser paid job so they had more flexibility to cope with their um, diagnosis. The same with PMDD and PCOS. Um, these are recognised reproductive health conditions um, that are not spoken about in the workplace. Mind, uh, PMDD has just been recognised as a mental health condition. It was an endocrine condition and it's now on, um, on the DSM-5 list as a mental health condition. Okay. Um, psychological, I'm trying to remember this without my slides. Psychological conditions. Along with all those biological conditions that comes with the psychological health of what it is to be a woman today, um, the silence of not being able to talk about that in the, woman, in the workplace will obviously impact everyone's psychological health. Stress, I will come on to stress more so later on, but stress is a big impact. There was um, a HSE study in 2017 that found across the whole spectrum of um, workers, women suffered more work-related stress than, than men. Social, uh, which is include, includes work, <clears throat> um, the social aspect of being a woman. Um, um, I really need my slides. <laughs> um, the social aspect of being a woman. In our society that we live in, we live in a patriarchal um, system, which I'm not, I'm not, this is not an anti-man talk either. It's not an anti-men talk. We appreciate that yeah. the culture and society. We, hello? Emma, it's Neil. Um, on the what makes a woman slide so which one do you want to go to um as in what just keep pressing it that's it yay no back back okay social uh including work attitudes and beliefs um attitudes and beliefs all around in all these four spectrums um make a difference it's society's aspect uh, attitude to a woman and our beliefs of ourselves of what it is to be a woman the care burden and unpaid work post covid um i'll get onto this next slide in a minute post covid this has increased um there is some research and some reports that are coming out saying that women have taken have stepped backwards the traditional um roles of a woman are being at home and looking after children and uh, the men going out to work, we are reverting back to that due to the um, constraints of what's happened um, during the pandemic. The care burden, um, most of the care burden um, falls on a woman, um, an unpaid work falls on a woman. 70% of dementia carers are women. Um, the care burden, that is in, in itself has seen to um, affect a woman's health outcome. There was some interesting research in Australia to suggest that suggested that it's called um, unencumbered work. It, unencumbered work means you are you can go to work and you don't have any dependents, you don't have any childcare or you don't have any elder care. And unencumbered work, men and women both have the same health outcomes. So both. Um, prone to the same diseases at the same time. The minute a woman had a child or she went into elder care, her, life, her health um, outcomes became poorer than a male. It's the care burden that is, uh, is not researched, it's not taken into account along with the unpaid work when we're looking at a female in the, work, in the workplace. The type of employment, women are more likely to be part-time. There is some um, stats to say that women take a, a role where they're um, more skilled for in a, uh, to 
to be able to juggle her family and the working conditions. The working conditions that we have um, are not designed for a, a woman, which we go on to in a minute. So the ethnicity and culture aspect of what makes a woman has really hit the headlines due to the pandemic and the disproportionate outcome. More males were susceptible to um, getting COVID-19 um, and to having a poorer health outcome. But uh, the Public Health England report and the women's reports that have come out have suggested that the disproportionate effect has affected um, black and um, ethnic minority staff, as you know, uh, um, people, as you know, um, disabled people are more likely to die and there's more likely to be a poor um, outcome for where you live and how much you earn. So our culture impacts our health and our, our culture in, um, has been proved, our attitudes have been, have been proved to how, th how that can impact our health outcomes. Structural racism and perceived racism has been indicated in the Public Health England report as part of the problem that um, contributed to more and more ethnic minority uh, patients and staff dying. Transphobia, uh, there was a wonderful um, one of these webinars 21 for 21 a couple of weeks ago and I don't know if you all attended it I certainly did it was Christina Riley a trans woman that was speaking about um, her experiences um, in the construction industry and what I found fascinating about that talk was she started to talk about the menopause and we still cut we since then and we've caught up and she was telling me she's been talking about that actually she goes through the menopause as well but there are no um, healthcare um, agencies out there to support a trans woman going through the menopause and the whole silence of this I've just spoke at the last what 10, 10 minutes going through reproductive health endometriosis PCOS PMDD infertility cancers as five gynecological cancers um, how often is that this spoken about in the workplace how often does this come into your assessment of when you're dealing with a woman and how often does this come into when you are doing your health uh, health promotion talks how often are these not just about the quality and diversity are they in your everyday talk next slide please okay so why should we specifically look at menopause in occupational health well Women over, uh, women over the age of 50 represent the fastest growing demographic in the workplace. We actually can't retire, um, we'll be working forever. Um, the, there is a, uh, obviously the pension deficit. Obviously we're at the time of our life now, there's never been a time like this for um, a female. We are more likely to be mid-career. We are more likely to have elder care. We are more likely to have childcare. We're more likely to have financial issues at the moment because our children cannot leave home. Um, they cannot get on the property ladder, so we've got the boomerang generation and our elderly parents are living longer, but not necessarily healthier. They're living with chronic conditions. Nearly eight out of 10 menopausal women are in work. There are 4.4 million women employed in the UK are aged 45 to 60. Around 2 million women aged over difficulties at work due to their menopause symptoms, which we come on. And what else? The menopause. So I would normally ask you to um, put in the chat or, you know, um, if I'm doing this face to face, come back to me and say, you know, how long do you think the menopause lasts? Well, actually, the menopause lasts one day. It's one day of your life. Before that, you're perimenopausal and after that, you're postmenopausal. It is char characterised as 12 months of your last day of your final period so unfortunately if you go 11 months and have a, a period you've got to wait another 12 months okay that's the biological thing um the biological definition of it however culturally culturally uh, the menopause defines a woman in this culture as old age a man is more likely to be defined as an old um, as uh, going into old age once he's retired he has um, his status with his job but a woman it is unfortunately when she's going through the menopause which it, at the moment, it is our, it is midlife. The menopause is not um, just a midlife disease, or a uh, sorry disease, that's me. The menopause is not just a midlife um, change, phase, transition. The menopause is actually once your hormones, estrogen, stop. Um, start to fluctuate or they cease altogether and this can happen for a number of reasons. It will naturally occur for women um, at the age of round about 51 but one in 10,000 women will be under 20. One in um, a 
yes, that's one in 10, 20,000 will be under 20, one in 10,000 under 30, and one in 1,000 will be under 40. This year at um, the World Menopause Day, the theme was premature ovarian insufficiency. Now that is for a woman who has gone through the menopause transition and is under 40, it's actually recognised as a medical condition because it needs a specific management. Um, women who suffer go through the menopause under 40 are more prone to chronic conditions earlier later on in life and so they need some um, medical assistance. I don't know if, you, if any of you ever caught, uh, caught any of the details on World Menopause Day, but there was a lots of young girls who had just gone through puberty and then went straight into the menopause. And they not only dealt with the biological changes that were going in their life, they were um, dealing with the cultural attitude and beliefs that menopause is just an old age disease. And they were actually 16 years old. The menopause can happen once you've had a hysterectomy and you've had your ovaries removed. It is quite severe that the symptoms afterwards can be quite severe because um, you are stopping the, you are inducing a, a, a menopause overnight and as a result the effects on the body can be more severe. It can happen um, due to treatment, due to polycystic ovary syndrome when you would induce the menopause um, to stop the symptoms from the, the polycystic ovary syndrome um, symptoms. So there are lots of reasons why women have to manage their fluctuating, fluctuating sex hormones and it isn't just the menopause, but it is it classed it is that one word, the menopause. OK, next slide. So these, this is taken from Lessons Learned, where women stand at the start of 2021. It's by the Women's Budget Group. That's a group of academics, leading researchers. Um, they all come together and they and analyse um, all the stats, um, economic and health stats, and they put recommended, recommendations back to the government. I've put these up here. I'm not going to read them all, and they will be on the slides, um, and you will be able to catch it later. But I recommend, if you're interested in this area, you look at this, this report report and it's a bit of a somber read but what the main thing that I wanted on this was there was a reduction of um, by a third of routine um, referrals into hospital care and like I said before women are more likely to be the ones that attend the GP so it's likely to impact women harder post-covid for not for everything from breast lumps to um, menstrual problems to sorting themselves out if they're perimenopausal it's going to hit them harder um, the reproductive health is going to be hit harder post-covid OK, gender is one of the characteristics associated with higher levels of depression during the pandemic. I mean, I think we know these things as healthcare practitioners. We know um, we know these stats, but it's a quite a somber read to see them written down. Next slide. OK, a bit of a biology lesson and you might understand why we perhaps need to uh, look at uh, menopause in the workplace. So the graph on the left. So going up 1,000 to 1 million is how many eggs you have, how many follicles, okay? And obviously that is age going across from left to right. That is your age from um, before you're born to the age of 51, okay? So before you're born, you have the most eggs. After you're born, they start to decline. Okay, now put a little red dot on the age of 37, 38, because that's when estrogen starts to play up. That's when your, your follicles are um, declining. So as a result, you're, you're not producing the same estrogen from your ovaries. So some months you may produce an egg, some months you, you, you might not. Um, some months you may produce two eggs. You may have, so you may have more heavy bleeding um, and you may go for a long period of time without a period and that's normal from the age of 38 you might not have the symptoms that normally starts with a woman um, you start to feel the impact from 45 but from 38 is where you start having estrogen fluctuations so what happens in your body because it likes to look after itself your brain recognizes that um, estrogen is low so the pituitary gland sends down a messenger to say hang on mate come on start producing um, more eggs and that is your follicle stimulating hormone so if you know about menopause you'll know that you can sometimes measure whether a woman is um, going through the menopause by how much her she has a follicle stimulating hormone in her blood now unfortunately um, it is not recommended by the nice guidelines that um, anyone under 
uh, anyone over 45 has that test because it's so unreliable because as we know it fluctuates every day so if you had a test and they said no they came back and said no your your hormones are fine they're at the right level the next day they might be fluctuating so above 45 you go by clinical symptoms and you go by a history and what you have to do is eliminate what it isn't so obviously some of these symptoms um, can be you know, um, due to your thyroid due to diabetes so what happens with a woman over 45 when she attends a gp is you eliminate what it isn't first under 45 you can more or less do um, the test you can do the two um, blood tests and you measure the hormones once and then six weeks later and you compare them so the graph on the right is showing you the estrogen and the uh, progesterone fluctuation. So in the premenopause phase, you can see a really nice graduating um, hill type estrogen where it goes up and down and it, you, you can see at the bottom it rises with um, when you, your lining of your womb, of your progesterone, and then when they both drop, you have your period. So in that green phase, that is a natural cycle of your hormones of um, estrogen and progesterone and then a period. In reality, we all, all women know it isn't like that at clockwork, but that's what it's supposed to look like. In between green and purple or brown, um, that is the age 38. That correlates to the red dot on the graph on the left. OK, and that's when your estrogen starts to play up starts to go up and down, up and down. Like you can see that sometimes you'll produce an egg, sometimes you won't. But estrogen is not not just um, a reproductive ho hormone that's that's increasing your it's maintaining your cycle. Estrogen for a female um, it protects um, it's cardioprotective, it's bone protective. It influences your serotonin and your neurotransmitters. It affects uh, it, it's needed throughout your body. So when that starts to fluctuate, you may start to feel symptoms that are not related to you, your, your periods or your menstrual health. So you may have normal periods right the way through that, but you'll start to have symptoms of brain fog, lack of concentration, social anxiety. They're the psychological ones. You can get bone problems with pains in your hip, your fingers, your joints, especially in the morning waking up, hip pain, skin. You're, we need estrogen with collagen in your skin. So as we get old, as you know that our skin changes on our faces, it also changes in our genital ur urinary tract. So you can imagine if you're feeling losing elasticity on your on the on your skin, on your hands and your face, it's actually happening in your genital urinary tract as well. So you could be starting with UTIs, um, it could be painful sex could be a whole host of symptoms that you don't actually attribute to a fluctuating estrogen. OK, and that can go on from 38 to 45. And Claire, Dr. Claire Hardy, who I've noticed that IOH had put up that she's doing um, another research. She did some research into menopausal symptoms and work related stress. And she, the conclusion came is they were so interlinked because of a woman of today is so interlinked with what's going on with us. Um, the situation we're in, we're mid-career, etc. what I've just talked about, and the fact that our hormones are up and down. Work-related stress and menopause symptoms probably were too complex and interrelated to um, pull apart. And this is how I came into this, into this job. So I'm occupational health background. Um, I was an expert in work-related stress. So a lot of case managers, case management that came my way um, were complex um, stress-related work. And I had two cases at the same time of women who were in their early 40s. So I had not, I did not have reproductive health in my um, head as I was doing my assessments with them. And they were both diagnosed with work-related stress. And quite rightly, they did have work-related stress. The working conditions were um, severe. You can imagine it was NHS, senior women, both in the ages of 41 with the um, lifestyle challenges that were going on. And it was a GP. And so what happened was we, they'd gone down the work related stress route and it was, you know, under the GP. It was um, started on medication, started talking therapy. Um, there was workplace um, adjustments in place, a very supportive manager and nothing was going right um, for this. Morning. Nothing was changing. And it, this very good GP suggested that this woman might be perimenopausal now I hadn't considered it and neither had the woman and the woman at 41 was quite offended because she dissociated menopause with old age they 
test, tested her, did her blood test and everything, and it correct, she was severe perimenopausal. She was in um, severe fluctuation of estrogen and she was started on the correct medication. It revolutionized her life, her social anxiety, her brain fog, her coping skills, her self-doubting, everything changed for her. And it made me look at my practice. It made me start to, and I started to research, I ended up going and um, training on, um, under the British Menopause Society in menopause care, in cancer care, the amount of women that return into work with breast cancer that have gone into induced, induced menopause, and yet we return the cancer to the work, we don't necessarily return the menopause symptoms. And breast cancer women who cannot take oestrogen, because obviously sometimes they're um, their tumour may be oestrogen dependent so they're on oestrogen blockers and so they will have problems with their hot flushes, with their joints, fine motor skills, not not um, permanently but they do it's over a period of time and they do need support in the workplace. So I started to look at case management through the lens of reproductive health. Um, I set up myself and um, I started to educate and train on women's health, not just to clinicians, but to um, workplaces, writing female policies, uh, sorry, gender specific policies and um, gender specific training and education. OK, next slide, please. OK, so at the, just after I trained, this came out. It's why I talk about menopause and the work. And this this helped me because um, it wasn't just me saying to organisations, look, we need to look at reproductive health in the workforce. The government um, condi uh, conducted um, this research and they looked at 100 different um, research articles and does the menopause impact um, the workplace? And basically what it came out and said was, yes, the menopause impacts the workplace and the workplace impacts the menopause and it came out with a lot of good recommendations. Next slide please. Okay so these are the results. Every woman will go through the menopause transition and 12% will have symptoms that will significantly affect their health and well-being. Three out of four women experienced hot flushes, 50% of women said work was more challenging, 47% of women did not tell their manager why they needed a day off. 25% have considered quitting their job and the workplace can support or make things worse. OK, next slide. Less than 20% of respondents said their workplace provided information about the menopause. 10.2 said their workplace had a menopause policy or guidance and 77% wanted more information about the menopause at work. And if you remember my first quote, it was empowering women about their health and so they could get informed, um, inform, evidence-based information and make informed choice. The top six symptoms, fatigue, hot flushes, difficulty concentrating, anxiety, worry, insomnia and problems with recall. Yes, I've seen them. And yes, that could be work related stress, couldn't it? Seven, se top seven workplace factors influence and severity of symptoms was high temperature, poor ventilation, humidity, no access to quiet area, space, dryness and lack of light and noise issues. Next slide. OK, so. Women. There's 25% 20, of women on that report suffered in the workplace. But what about the 75% who sailed through the menopause? Now, we all know someone who says they sailed through the menopause. My mum says it. She says she can't really remember it. It's a bit like childbirth. She sailed through it. Me and my sister would beg to differ. And I remember it quite clearly. No one sails through the menopause. In... 1851 the average age of the menopause was 45 and the average life expectancy of a woman was 46. In 2019 the average age of the menopause was 51. The average life expectancy of a woman was 84. We are living in a time now where we've never lived before because we are living a third of our life without the protective properties of oestrogen. Now, we don't we don't lose oestrogen. It gets produced by the adrenal glands and the fat cells, but it's not like the ones that come from your ovaries. So this time now is it's never happened before. The third of our life, and if we have a third of our life where we think we're old, we're over the hill and we're not worth it, and society views us like that, that's a pretty sad situation to be in. But not only that, your health is impacted in that third of your life where you don't have any oestrogen. 
So the menopause transition extends beyond hot flushes, sweats, and includes psychological symptoms, musculoskeletal, vaginal, bladder, and sexual effects. After childbirth, one in three women will have um, incontinence issues. Incontinence issues, if you suffer with incontinence issues, you are double fold um, at risk of um, suffering from postpartum depression. Incontinence issues is the second cause for a woman to be admitted to a nursing home. So she might have all her faculties, but incontinence issues are, you know, she, but she ends up going into a nursing home because she can't manage at home. Incontinence issues can be fixed. 84% of women that do their pelvic floor exercises can fix their pelvic floor issues. Um, I will give you some more, I'll give you some more information later on, but there's a fantastic um, group of female um, physiotherapists called Pelvic Raw. It's a group of them. It's um, Elaine Miller is one of them. She is a stand-up comedian. She does the Edinburgh Fringe, but she's passionate about women's health and she's taken on a lot of um, influential people to challenge them because she says we need to educate women from the minute they have um, they give birth about their pelvic floor and if you go to see a female therapist female specific therapist and you do their three month kegel exercises 84 percent of women will be cured of their um, stress incontinence or urging continent continence the long-term cardiovascular effects of health so, like I said, once we go through the menopause and we lose cardio protectiveness of estrogen, we suddenly um, become at, at the same as risks as a man um, with it for cardiovascular disease. More women die of heart attacks than men, not because we have more heart attacks than men, it's because we don't recognise a female heart attack. Because when we discuss heart attacks, we discuss central chest pain, great and clammy. Majority of women do not suffer heart attacks like that. They are more likely to get abdominal pain. They're more likely to go to A&E. They're more likely to be um, treated as if they've got abdominal pain, sent home with some painkillers and then die of a heart attack. 50% of women and 20% of men will sustain osteoporotic fractures. Falls and fractures took up 4. million hospital beds. Now, Osteoporosis, obviously it can be genetic, but it can also be managed. When a woman is growing up and she's developing her bone density, the more you do, the more active you are, the more you increase your bone density. And that sort of like sticks until, until the age of 30. At the age of 30, it starts to decline. When you go through the menopause, because you need estrogen to help bone, um, bone density, it starts to decline more rapidly. The way to combat that is weight bearing exercises. If you don't use it, you lose it type thing. So we need to increase our exercises um, around the menopause. But we live in a society where women don't do team sports. Um, they don't they're not likely to be go to the gym. I know that I'm being general here. I know a lot of us can go to the gym, but it's not someone's favorite place. It's not a lot of women's favorite place. They feel self-conscious. If our children are, um, if our daughters are needing a help, I'm talking about my family now. If um, my stepdaughter is carrying heavy bags, I know that dad will pick the heavy bags up for her because she's a female and that, you know, she obviously needs support. Actually not, she needs to start carrying heavy loads. We are more likely to pick our stepdaughter up um, from a night out because we don't like her walking home for her safety but then again we're reducing her walking so a female in society were more likely to be sedentary workers not clinicians obviously but office-based workers um, are more likely in secretaries are more likely to be in it's a female profession so I'm generalizing here but you get the gist that we don't move enough in our society as a woman and as a result 50% of women will sustain an osteoporotic fracture as clinicians are full of working lives and work-related stress and poor quality of life, if we don't take into um, account reproductive health when we're doing our um, assessments and we don't look at red flags of exercise and things like that, then we are not doing an inclusive assessment. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the rationale for prevention. So this is clinic, this is for us. 
Millions of women are entering the menopause. 40% are experiencing symptoms affecting their health and well-being. Chronic disease begins 10 years after the onset of natural menopause. And women who experience that's premature ovarian insufficiency, that is early menopause women um, under 40. Surgical or treatment-induced menopause have an increased risk of poorer health outcomes. A major opportunity exists within occupational health, not only to help manage these symptoms, but to identify health risks and to introduce preventative strategies. I don't know if you remember 10 years ago, stress, you couldn't talk about stress, you couldn't talk about mental health, could you? Because it just was a stigma, it was a taboo. And occupational health played a key part in getting rid of that stigma and helping um, um, employers manage mental health. Um, this is like um, reproductive health is like stress 10 years ago. I, you know, I, this is a really great outcome, this everybody um, coming onto this webinar. But three years ago, I put on a uh, managing menopause in the workplace and I had five people turn up out of hundreds um, of an, of an organisation. They either didn't see it was them women didn't want to be seen there men ma male managers thought might have thought that um, it wasn't anything to do with them it might have been seen as an equality and diversity small initiative i'm glad to see that menopause and reproductive health is is, is um getting more um visibility. I've said this before and I say this on all talks, if Wills and Kate, what they have done for um, mental health, if we got someone like them to start talking about reproductive health, and we do have Michelle Obama, um, when she came out and she talked about um, what it was like to suffer with infertility and she had she had miscarriages I mean that it helped women enormously and there's, there's other things um, that you know that's for another talk. Next slide. Okay, so as clinicians, we like tools. We like uh, we like to do evidence based. We like to have a tool, a score that we can say yes, we've we've scored this, and this is what we recommend. So this is the menopause rating scale. Now it's up to you how you you approach this, how you think you uh, might introduce this into your practice. Um, like I said, there's still a stigma and there's still a taboo uh, around the menopause. It's still seen as um, an age disease type thing. So you don't want to be up for age discrimination if you start saying to women of 38, um, you know, let's have a look at your menopause rating scale. So, it, you know, we, we use, we're realistic and it's how you would use this. But this was a tool designed for women to use themselves to help um, clinicians understand what they were going through. Um, I've put it, I've just put it on here. It is a quick, um, a quick guide and it incorporates all of the symptoms. And it's easy to say if a woman's you know, starts ticking moderate, severe, very severe to a lot of them, that is a good tool for her to take to a GP. Because don't forget, she has eight minutes with her GP. And if you've got five symptoms, you're not entirely sure what they are. Um, it's very difficult to get an overview for the GP as well. Next slide, please. OK, inclusive signposting. OK, make every contact count. So, like I've just said, if you keep in your mind bone, heart and genitourinary and sexual issues, if you've got a woman, think of her age, think of her history. When you take a history, do you ask if she suffers with incontinence post-birth? Do you do an inclusive assessment? Vitamin D, everybody in the country should take vitamin D. Um, in the uh, winter months and um, certain characteristics should take it all year round. So that would be ethnic minority, care homes, um, people who work indoors and be aware of sunscreen because obviously we're slapping sunscreen on all that will stop some vitamin D getting through and risk behaviours. Smokers are more likely to be osteoporotic. Um, smokers are more likely to go through the menopause a bit earlier. So you can signpost. The Royal Society of Osteoporosis have some fantastic fact sheets. Really, really good. I don't need to talk about them because they say it all. And exercise. You, you know, start talking about weight bearing exercise. Now put FRAC score on there. Now the FRAC score was like another tool that you could use, and that was um like it give you an indication of your probability of of um, developing osteoporosis in the next ten years. And it used to be on the Royal Society of Osteoporosis's website, um, but it's not there. So I'll have to check out why it's not there now. Public Health England, obviously, with all their recommendation of how much exercise you should do. Heart, exactly the same. Age, history, exercise, diet, risk behaviours. 
you can signpost, make sure they've had their NHS health check, know your numbers, exercise, healthy behaviours. British Heart, British Heart Foundation have a really good um, page on the menopause and a female heart attack. The same with the others. History, have they had children? If they've had children, they're likely to have had some sort of dysfunction, stress, urge incontinence, frequent UTIs, sexual loss, um, loss libido, things like that. I know that it might be difficult to bring that up in a case management scenario and it might not seem appropriate, but asking certain questions and, and the way we do it um, can open up um, for the first time an, an issue that you can signpost to the GP. There's pelvic raw, like I said. The College of Sexual and Relationships and Therapists, I've just put that on there for you, for your interest. Exercise, now I've put un, um, unhappy faces there because women with stress incontinence really don't want to run. Um, so there's a squeezy app, it's NHS endorsed, um, you can look for that and that's to help with pelvic floor. But I would recommend anybody going to the Pelvic Raw re website for any um, of those issues. Next slide. Okay, so this is things to ask yourself in your workplace. How inclusive, how is inclusion and diversity represented in your workplace? How many women ethnically diverse, neurodiverse, LGBTQI and disabled employees are senior leaders on the board, heads of charities and public bodies? If they aren't there, if they aren't up there, you're, they're le you're less likely to have a, a positive role model and you're less likely to have reproductive health on the health and wellbeing agenda. Given that all women menstruate, some will get pregnant and all will experience the menopause transition, how is women's health discussed or signposted in your workforce? In the absence of adequate role models and being included, groups have been set up to provide support and listen. And now, I, I, and the way I'm talking, it, it's all like very down, but actually some of the workplaces I've gone into have done fantastic things. There's some great um, menopause policies, there's the menopause cafe initiative that was set up across the country. You can signpost women to join their nearest menopause cafe. There are some great things going on there. And I'm sure you must have come across some. Consequences of not doing anything. Next slide. Okay, so. These are not just women's problems that we're talking about. The design processes of PPE have been found to be fit male bodies, um, not just male bodies, but they don't fit all women. The PPE did not go around a headscarf. And there was a fantastic um, policewoman in Birmingham who wore a headscarf and she designed some PPE that went around um, her headscarf and she's won awards for that. Welfare facilities, like I've just said, women menstruate. Not only do we menstruate, we have to put a lot of colour on our faces because that's what's acceptable in our society and we have to have um, a nice hairstyle. So there was, a, there was that image of, um, what's he called? Um, I'm having a menopausal moment now. Ed Sheeran winning the one of the Grammys or winning some awards with Beyonce. He came on the stage and he looked like he'd just fallen out of bed. And I think he admitted he had. I think he had egg stains on his T-shirt and his hair was ruffled. And Beyonce came out looking like a goddess. And it must have taken about six hours for her to get ready. And that, to me, epitomised how we accept men and women on this, our gender roles that we give men and women. There was no way she would be allowed to roll out of bed with her hair like that with egg on her T-shirt. That would have been all over the media for the next few weeks. It would have been talking about Beyonce's fall from grace. And that's because women are expected to put makeup on and we, we enjoy it, it's part of our culture. But our toilets are not just for going to the toilet to have a pee. We are there, we might be menstruating, we like a chat in the toilets as well, and also we have hair and makeup to do. So whenever there's, um, you'll know this, the uh, inadequate welfare facilities, never mind at work, but if you go into a concert or whatever, you know, at half time, you go to the toilet, your partner, you, if you have a male partner will come back and he can see the second act, the woman probably misses half the second act because she's been at the toilet. I've put marching on there because I read something recently about, um, I can't remember which, which uh, military it was, whether it was RAF or the army. And what they'd found was that women, um, uh, women soldiers were having problems with their pelvis and they were having small fracture lights in their pelvis and what they brought it down to is actually marching not 
marching in itself, but the stride, the way they're taught to stride was based on a male stride. So they were actually pushing their pelvis out more once they were marching. So the way things are designed is around the male body. And the environment we've also we've already talked about hot flushes now the hot flushes i'm not going to go into that that is actually um, a different one a different um webinar but the environment where um, our workplaces are more designed towards a male experience of a body so it, for women we're either too cold and we sit there with a coat on and gloves on when everybody else in t-shirts or we're opening and flapping everything around with a fan and opening windows so Getting back to um, workplace, so there were two cases um, under the Equality Act that involved the menopause. Davish versus Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services 2018. This was a woman who had uh, menopausal symptoms for about a year. She'd had cognitive impairment and she also had urinary problems. And her medication um, that she had was, it was like a Barocca. She had to drop it into the water and um, it turned the water a different color. She was she was a court clerk and the barrister was um, stood next to her desk and her uh, barrister picked up her water and drank it. She said, oh, no, you know, that's my medication. You know, stop that. He um, complained about her. He lost his case. And I, I from what I can gather, he was quite um, uh, vocal about that. He'd been drinking hormones and he was going to um, grow women's breasts and things like that. And it was a whole kahooey about it. And she was sacked. And the reason she was sacked was because they found her to be malicious because the water that she'd stopped him drinking was clear. Now she, like I said, her medication changed the, the color of the water. And so they'd said she knew that there was no medication in that water. So she'd maliciously done it. The case went to appeal and she won. The case went to, sorry, tribunal and she won under the Equality Act. Now, this is the only time I've ever come across this. The menopause was classed as a disability. And the reason, as we know, um, obviously a, a, a court is the only person that can, uh, the only um, place that uh, a disability can, uh, under the Equality Act, can be classed as a disability. And they classed it because she'd been under her GP for over a year. The medication that she'd been having maintained her um, health and well-being and if she removed that medication she would suffer severe consequences so in her case the gp had written saying that yes she'd had cognitive problems and the workplace were aware of it and so it would be conceivable that she might not know in the heat of the moment when the barrister was kicking off that um, she hadn't put her medication in so she was reinstated and £16,000 awarded to her. I actually think they are appealing on that. Marchant versus BT. BT did have actually really good menopause uh, policies in place or sorry, women's reproductive health uh, policies in place. But however, this woman um, under a GP, um, I cannot remember what the symptoms were, but the GP had written an adjustment note to say, um, a fit note with adjustments saying that, you know, she probably needed to um, organise her work slightly and do it in chunks of time, things like that, but over to you, manager. The manager, whose wife had sailed through the menopause, said there's no such thing and didn't follow those adjustments. But because um, he was an employee of BT, they were culpable for his actions. And so she won the case under the Equality Act for age discrimination. So the business costs, attrition, sickness, absence, presenteeism, I don't need to go that with, through that with occupational health staff, we're well aware um, of what the case of not doing something is. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is best practice. So this is this is based on attending webinars with lawyers and discussing reproductive health in the workplace. So what they're saying is this is an unprecedented time really we're still learning from um, reproductive health cases um, in employment law and tribunals so the best way to go is this for best practice provide an accessible policy and or management guide include menopause and women's health in well-being conversations to normalize it educate all key personnel Conduct a risk assessment to identify hazards that can be reduced. Well, that's a given. We know that. There's a, the RCN do a really, really good risk assessment that I use. That I just send. I don't, obviously don't do them myself. I send them to managers and say, this is a good place to start. It's a good place to have a conversation with the woman. Involve occupational health. Of course, we all know that. Implement reasonable adjustment plans, flexible working, agile working, and women's wellness networks in the workplace um, do wonders. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and this is the last slide you'll be pleased to know. One of the greatest underappreciated sources of innovation and new business may, may be, in fact, women over 50 with lots of life ahead of them and with the verb to get it done. Okay, thank you. I don't know how I'm going to receive questions, actually. <laughs> Right, um, Emma. So that was fabulous. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, we also owe you an apology because we kept you waiting. Um, and okay. I know as a presenter, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, quite, um, uh, quite daunting, but then to, to be kept waiting in limbo. So uh, I am really, really very sorry. Um, That's okay. To, to the members as well um, and uh, to our non-members. Uh, yes, uh, again, Apologies to you guys. Um, it isn't uh, uh, the, the, the normal level of service that uh, we uh, like to uh, provide for you, um, but uh, I promise that we will do better next time, and that's the only thing I can say. Um, ha I don't know whether we can, um, if there is, uh, I think, has everybody got the um, uh, chat at the bottom where you can type in messages if you've got questions for Emma? Neil, there is a question tab. There are a couple of questions. All right, there is. Yes, I can see it. So, um, right, okay, so. Where are we? Let's have a look. Can't hear anything. Da -da 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 -da. Emery's muted. Bear with me one second. We'll get to some. Ah, right, yes. So um, uh, uh, Dawn Sandell has asked, will we be able to have the slides, please? So um, Emma, yeah. are you happy for those slides to be um, shared? Yes, I am. Yeah. OK, so what we'll do, guys, is um, we'll get the attendance list from Danny and we'll send those uh, out to you. Uh, Janet O'Neill says, excellent Emma, such well-rounded information delivered with passion. So uh, I think that's a comment. Um, again, Dawn said it was wonderful. Uh, Sam Roberts saying it's wonderful. <laughs> um, and Justin Green has said, have sage and clover been approved for alternative treatments for menopause? Um, uh, approved as in on the NICE guidelines. So um, the NICE guidelines go through um, all recommended treatments and so what they, with sage and clove because it's a, a, a natural product and, and I'm not saying it's not, it doesn't work because it absolutely does for some women because it doesn't go through the rigorous clinical trials they can't say yes this works or no it doesn't but they do recognize that it does work so it is it is in the nice guidelines did I read something recently where they're doing some um, research with um, another uh, herb? Was it um, rosemary? Red? Yes. Yeah, so that's Claire Hardy. I saw you put that in the group. So Claire Hardy has done a lot of work about menopause and the workplace, and it's her research on work-related stress and the menopause. It's fantastic. Um, you, you just Google it and you'll see her paper. Um, and they recommend everything on the best practice as well as CBT inform um, CBT um, for all whether you're on HRT or not if you're suffering with psychological issues. Absolutely I'm a big advocate of CBT anyway but I can see that yeah. we have some value here so that would be brilliant. Um, so yeah I think we need to watch out for that um, that research once it's published in probably a year or so uh, I would have thought. Um, and then we've got some uh, comments from Faith Gombe, who says, hi, Faith, um, miss you very much. Um, she's saying, well presented and very informative, uh, very interesting topic. Thank you very much. Maria Keatley says, great presentation, and please don't uh, be stressing about the technical difficulties. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's well received. I can tell you I was stressing so much. Um, and then we've got uh, Valerie uh, has asked, uh, how can we improve estrogen levels later on in life? So you you probably you can't improve estrogen levels um, unless you take HRT or the equivalent. However, Japanese women do not suffer with hot flushes, um, so they know that culture culture impacts um, the severity of symptoms. That's also it's a bigger 
um, question um, answer. So phytoestrogens are found in soya and lots of other things. I think it's in linseed. And they think that Japanese women not having hot flushes partly is to do with having phytoestrogens um, in their diet, but also the culture that it is a matriarchal culture where it's celebrated as you get older. So if you are, um, so if you want to improve estrogen, um, I can't, um, unless you take HRT, but phytoestrogens may give you estrogenic properties. So that's only obviously if you you know you can take it obviously if you're on tamoxifen or an estrogen blocker you certainly would stay away from your phytoestrogens absolutely yep right uh, so dorothy has said really great webinar thank you really interesting from mandy georgiou brilliant presentation um uh, arlene donnelly has asked what's the best natural way to com uh, combat estrogen estrogen deficiency so i think we've we've probably touched on that but is there anything you could add uh, yes yeah so um so what I, ha I what you will I will share with you all is my signposting that I do for everybody for um for clinicians and for employers and the British Menopause Society and the Women's Health Concern that's the female aspect of British Menopause Society have loads of fact sheets on um everything you can think of so if you you know you go down the HRT route there's that but there's also what you can eat to, to help um your exercise, your diet, it helps migraines, everything. So women's health concern, um, start there for um, information on, um, on food that can help you. Right, okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, Tessa Disniake says, um, uh, thank you, Emma, really helpful. Um, there's a question from Amanda Foster. What's the best evidence-based intervention that you would recommend? Are there leaflets or training for managers or is it very individual? Evidence-based information for a woman. Um, so for a woman, um, the first they say the first line of defence is HRT, but obviously that comes with its issues. Not everybody can take it. Some people don't want to take it. Um, but then obviously with the neurotransmitters, um, serotonin, nor, um, nor adrenaline being affected, um, affect your thermal neutral zone. So antidepressants also help with um, hot flushes for brain and cognitive. Um, issues the same thing it will um, there's, there's if you go through the nice guidelines there's a step by step of what you can take for managers there are so I'll send the fact sheet will be um, I'll send it to you so you've got guidance for managers on there you've got risk assessments um, and you've got the menopause um, rating scale that I've put on there as well for you there is there is nothing um, well, there there is nothing that I, I have found that's a, a, a one toolkit fits all that's got, you know, for managers and employees, apart from the work I do, obviously. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So Rachel House has said, um, did you say there was an assessment form for menopause symptoms? Is it really like a copy? And she's sorry that her daughter woke up, so she had to uh, miss that bit. So yeah, so... I'll cool. send it all to you, Neil. I'll, I'll send it to you. So it is just a PDF that I've got of um, all the things I've talked about today, of, of the, the scales and the charities, um, where you can signpost to um, all your employees to. I'll send it. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. So Geraldine Gillespie, is there anything that can help with memory fog? Yeah, there are lots of things really. Um, so I know that we all, we all have to put up with it, but it, it is about um, sleep. Um, it is about um, pacing things. It is about using memory aids, um, you know, writing things down, um, having alerts on your phone. And if it's severe, there is um, a CBT help book that um, is written by um, Dr. Professor Hunter, who is, is dedicated her life's work to menopause. And it's um, a self-help guide that has been proved um, to improve um, your symptoms. They don't get rid of them, you manage them better. And that is also on, you know, on the fact sheet. I've put that um, book on there for anybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so Marina says, where are we? Oops. Um, yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, Jane Hill has said, sounds like a Japanese diet might be the way forward. Yep. Yep. Uh, Valerie, um, uh, is there such a thing as male menopause? Um, I can assure you there is. 
Yep, there is. It's called andropause. Um, yep. Yeah, and unfortunately, the same thing. Andropause has got, a, a, you know, there's negative connotations that go with andropause. So andropause will be a reduction of the male hormones and um, unfortunately, polycystic ovary syndrome as well. Um, because you have um, a high lot of testosterone in, in, in your body. and But it is more gradual, where a, a woman, like I said, at, at 38 to 51 starts to plummet, um, males gradually lose testosterone um, that has the same, same impact on irritability, brain fog. Um, so yes, it does exist. Yeah, mine uh, mine was caused actually quite interestingly. I don't mind um, uh, talking about this, by the way, um, by um, taking tramadol um, over a long period of time, um, and tramadol has been linked to an increase uh, in uh, uh, andropause, and right. it basically knocked off my um, uh, testosterone uh, messages that uh, uh, you know come from your your brain uh, for you to then uh, produce it. Um, so I don't produce any uh, testosterone at all, and I'm on testosterone replacement, and that was thanks to medication. So um, that was... Uh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's definite iatrogenesis. Gosh. Right. Okay. Um, Amanda Foster, thank you. That was brilliant. Um, and I think we're more or less there. So um, unless anybody's got any final questions, I think we've uh, been uh, at it for long enough. It's almost half past <laughs> nine. Yeah. Um, and again, thank you, guys. Uh, there's been a lot of reassurance that, you know, it's IT problems. We've all been there. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that. I, I actually did uh, feel as though I'd personally let you down. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, I'm hoping that we've recorded this. It says recording on my screen. Um, I'll try and edit the bits out at the beginning um, and we'll have it up on to uh, the uh, YouTube channel at some point tomorrow. Um, if any of you uh, aren't members, uh, we'd love to have you. Um, so obviously, if you can go to ioh.org.uk and sign up for just £10 a year. Uh, we've got some really interesting webinars coming up on um, sight loss in the workplace. We've got Erlos Danlos syndrome coming up, which is the hypermobility disorder. Um, we've got um, all sorts of things coming up. So watch this space and we hope to be back with you very, very soon. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, take care and um, be safe out there. Bye. Thank you, Emma. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.